The next topic uh, we are going to cover in our class on aging is the topic of attention. However, before we start talking about how attention changes with age, we need to get a little grip on what is it that we actually mean when we're talking about attention. That is the construct of attention as psychologists use it. And it turns out there's many ways to skin this cat. And uh, I'm going to essentially talk about uh, just one aspect of attention and uh, the essential properties of, of that aspect of attention are listed on the slide you're currently viewing. So we begin with the known fact that human information processing capacity is quite limited. That is, we can only process so much information per second, per unit time. This is well-documented and well-quantified. However, we also know that our senses, vision, hearing, taste, touch, smell, bombard our brain with much, much, much more information than our cognitive systems are able to process at any given time. So what the mind needs, what the brain needs, is some way to manage this overflow of information coming from the senses to the cognitive systems. And that's what the construct of attention is all about. Attention selects task relevant stimuli that are coming in from our senses, all that, all that information, it selects the information that is task relevant. And that information that is selected is then passed on to the cognitive systems for higher levels of processing, such as recognition of an object. So in a nutshell, attention reflects the management of our limited cognitive resources. And it involves things like focusing on the right information. Well, what is the right information? Well, that depends on your goal. And so the right information is, if you will, goal relevant or task relevant information. Attention also can be more complex in that we might be managing multiple goals at the same time, and we have to switch back and forth between those goals concurrently, the so-called multitasking situation. And finally, I want to note on this slide that attention uh, can be guided by both top-down as well as bottom-up processes. So an example of attention being guided by a top-down process would be one in which our knowledge, our expectancy, our experience about certain situations guides where we look for task-relevant stimuli. Very salient example would be you have experience with a playground in your neighborhood. When you drive by that playground, you in the past have encountered several instances where children tend to come out from between parked cars, et cetera, and run into the street in front of you. So now that you have learned that, that you have that experience, the next time you drive by the playground, what do you do? Instead of just looking randomly as you drive by, you tend to bias your attention, your visual search to those parked cars, et cetera, to watch for little children that might be about to come out in front of your car so that you can take the appropriate action. So our knowledge and our expectancy from the top down can manage where we deploy our attention. But attention also can be guided by stimulus properties per se. Certain things like a sudden flash of light or movement in our periphery reflexively drive our attention, guide our attention to where the action is, and then we can evaluate the stimuli that we then process at those locations of this salient bottom-up event. We're going to look at uh, at least one demonstration that shows how these top-down and bottom-up processes complement one, uh, one another in our, if you will, uh, perception of uh, the environment. So before we start talking about age differences specifically, I would like to, if you will, uh, present several very famous attention demonstrations that help us capture some of the important aspects of attention that I just outlined on the previous slide. And the first demonstration we're going to experience 
is uh, quite a famous one, and it involves uh, what I'd refer to as a special game of basketball. And in this special game of basketball, we have two teams, a team wearing white jerseys and a team wearing black jerseys. And there are two basketballs instead of one. Each team has their own ball. And the objective of this game is to pass the ball as many times as you can to your teammate in a given period of time. And so your task when you're watching the video of this special basketball game is to count the number of times the white team passes the ball. So what's your task? To count the number of times the white team passes the ball. So let's see how well you can perform the seemingly simple task. Okay, so you just watched that special game of basketball. How many times did the white team pass the ball? Was it 12, 13, 14, 15 times? Well, actually, I don't really care about that. What I do care about is whether or not you saw midway through the video, the large gorilla, the person in a gorilla suit, walk across the scene, beat his chest, and then proceed to walk off the stage. If you're like many people, you never even noticed that happened in the video. And some of you may have noticed it, but uh, and many of you may have noticed it because you've seen this video demonstration before in another psychology class or online someplace. But uh, to naive viewers, only about 80% about of the people do not see the gorilla. And I will show you the same video clip in a moment to confirm that there really was a gorilla there in uh, just a moment so you can essentially if you didn't see it you can convince yourself that it was actually there and this phenomenon of not seeing that gorilla it's very obvious in the middle of the scene this phenomenon is called inattention blindness and it refers to the fact that you actually need to deploy attention to an object in order to process it deeply enough to recognize it and in this dynamic situation of the special basketball game with the white team and the black team interacting, going in front of one another, that is so overwhelming to your cognitive systems, you can't process all that information. So what attention does is it focuses with extreme prejudice on your task goal, counting the white team's number of passes. And that suppresses the processing of other information such as the black team. So when the gorilla comes out on the uh, screen, a black gorilla, you don't notice the black gorilla most of the time because you're so busy suppressing the black moving objects in the service of counting the activities of the white moving objects, the white team, so to speak. So when your attention is very focused, you can miss very, very salient aspects of the environment. So think of what the, the implications of this demonstration uh, might be. It shows that eyewitness testimony, for example, can be quite erroneous. Things can happen right in front of your eyes and you don't even notice them happening because your attention might be drawn to another aspect of the scene. Um, we might also want to ask ourselves, hmm, would older people as a group be more or less likely to see the gorilla in this demonstration than younger people? Well, we don't know enough about aging and attention yet to sort of speculate about that hypothesis, that hypothetical question. But hopefully by the time we get through this unit, you'll be able to make a prediction about that. So what I'd like to do right now is to show you that video again and to take a look at it and you will obviously be able to see the gorilla now and after that uh, replay if you will 
we're going to look at another famous uh, demonstration of um, the interaction between bottom-up and top-down processes in the guidance of visual attention. Okay, we're about to do a demonstration of a phenomenon known as change blindness. And what you're going to see here is uh, a two frame animation. That is, we're gonna take a picture and then we're gonna copy that picture. So we're gonna have two copies, A and B. In copy B, we're going to erase one of the objects in the image. So that now we have two pictures, the original, and which we'll call A, and picture B, which will be just like the original, except an object will be missing. And now we're gonna show you a little animation. And the animation will show you picture A, and then we'll immediately replace it with picture B. Then back to A, B, A, B, so, uh, and so forth. If you do an animation like I just described, the change that occurred, the object that was deleted from the scene, will immediately pop out as something that's disappearing or suddenly appearing. However, if we do a little trick, if we insert a little flash of light between the two pictures, this changes from being a very easy task to a very difficult one. And so let's take a look at the demonstration and um, try to experience it for ourselves. Then we'll follow up with a little bit of a, a, an explanation, if you will for what we think is going on in this change blindness demo. So let's begin. What we're gonna see first here is this example of some troops loading a plane. And uh, we're seeing the picture flashing back and forth. And there's an object that's suddenly appearing and disappearing in this uh, scene. And some of you may already see it, but many of you probably don't see what's changing. So let's get rid of the flash and when we do that, we will see that you can't help but see what's changing. And in this case, it's that jet engine that's suddenly appearing and disappearing under the wing. And when we add the flash back, as we're doing here, you can't help but now notice that it is indeed the jet engine. Why? Because you already know what's changing, so you can direct your attention to the engine. So now that we've got a little familiarity with this particular task, let's take a look at another scene and see if we can figure out what is changing in uh, the scene across flashes. Okay, so now we're seeing another scene. It's a harbor scene, some boats and some water, and there's even a young man in the foreground. And we need to ask ourselves, what is changing in the scene? Now I could take the flash out and you would immediately see what was changing because of bottom-up cues, that is a sudden change in luminance would inform us where to look for the action. But we can also use top-down guidance. I can give you clues about where it could be. For example, I think the object that's changing is in the large boat. And I could be even more specific. I could say it's a blue object. And when I do that, Almost all of you will notice that it's a blue box that's appearing and disappearing in the back of the boat. And when we take the flash out, uh, it becomes immediately apparent that that is the case. So let's insert the flash again and do one more example here. Put a 90 millisecond flash in there and we'll do one more example before we finish this demonstration. And now we ask ourselves, gee, what is changing in the scene? And if you're looking, you might be hypothesizing, gee, is the wine glass getting full or empty? Is it changing from white to red wine, etc.? Are the two people changing their facial expressions? But now if you look in the background, you will see, aha, it's that railing that's going up and down and up and down. And indeed, if we take the flash away, 
it becomes so apparent that we can't help but see it. So what was this change blindness demonstration trying to tell us? Why is it that when we inserted the flash between image A and image B, that the normal ability of a change, sudden appearance or disappearance of an object, failed to grab our attention? What is it about that flash? What did it do? Well, if you consider what the, the physical nature of the flash, the entire image turned gray, and then the gray went away and back to the next image. And so it was a flash over the entire image. The bottom-up systems were essentially telling the top-down systems that there was a flash, but the flash was everywhere. So that information was not useful to the top-down systems. The bottom-up system said there was change, but there was change everywhere. So that didn't provide any guidance to the top-down system, so to speak. Normally, our attention is influenced by both top-down and bottom-up information. The top-down stuff, expectancy, learning, experience, very, very important in guiding where we look, where we attend in our environment. But sometimes unexpected things occur, and it's important that we have a mechanism that can guide attention to check out those unexpected and important events that occur. And that's what the change blindness paradigm demonstrates, that when you cancel out those bottom-up influences, the ability to see where the action is, to notice important changes in the environment is greatly compromised because we've taken the bottom-up systems out of the loop. And so, for example, when you come to an intersection when you're driving and you look to the left and you look to the right and then you proceed to go through the intersection, that you're the stop sign, um, you have the illusion, if you will, that when you look to the left, you processed everything. And when you look to the right, you processed everything and made the determination that it was safe to proceed. But what the change blindness paradigm reveals is you're not processing everything. What you're really doing when you look left and right is you're seeing, is there any action? And if there is any action, motion, changes in brightness, et cetera, you check it out. Oh, I see a car moving. But then you judge it's so far away, I have plenty of time to proceed. Or, oh, here comes a truck. I need to wait for that truck to clear the intersection before it's safe to proceed. Uh, in my own research with aging populations in, in the realm of driving, one of the things we've noticed is that between about 25 and 35 percent of the older population, people over the age of 70, seem to have diminished capabilities in their bottom-up system to guide their attention. Uh, we call that the transient sustained shift, if you, if you will, in, in, in the literature and uh, that bottom-up system seems to be somewhat impaired. And that makes older drivers more cautious because they have experienced many instances when suddenly they notice things that they should have noticed but didn't notice. And that's one of the things that makes drivers very, very cautious because they want to avoid those sort of unexpected surprises in uh, the future. <laughs>